right, so I'm going to make up for this morning. This morning, of course, we sang for 30 minutes. So now we're going to sing one, Congregational Hymn. So if you would, grab number 417 in your brown book. Number 417, I Shall Know Him. specials that were done this morning i mean that that was wonderful thank you for everyone who did that there's good special music i i came in tonight and be turning to john chapter 20 if you will but i came in tonight and i'm not going to name names but somebody asked me they saw that we were singing one song and i was asked said do you have a long sermon tonight and i said challenge accepted so uh, all right, so we are uh, this morning, uh, if you remember this morning, we saw that Jesus is risen. He's our risen Lord and Savior. He came out of the tomb. That's what we had been building to over the last several weeks through the triumphant entry and through the trials and the arrest and the crucifixion, ultimately his resurrection today. And so tonight we're going to look at a little bit of stuff post-resurrection, post uh, what was going on. So we are looking at John chapter 20. This is one of my favorite accounts of an individual because kind of like Peter, I can relate to Peter because Peter messes up. Uh, Thomas, I think we can all semi-relate to Thomas because we're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. We all have uh, doubts sometimes. And so we can learn so much from these passages of Scripture. Uh, tonight we will be jumping around a little bit and then coming back so I hope you got your Bible. So looking at John chapter 20, we're going to start with verse 24. If you want to stand for the reading of God's word, it's going to be John chapter 20, starting with verse 24. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas was with them. 
came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just bow before your throne, just praising you, Father, for what today symbolizes. We praise you for the resurrection. We praise you that the tomb is empty. We praise you that we serve a risen Lord and Savior. We praise you that Jesus willingly took our shame and our sin on the cross. He paid the price for our sin. That he came out of the grave three days later offering us free salvation if we would simply put our faith and trust in him. Lord, we praise you that that salvation is eternal and can never be lost because it's kept in his very hand. Father, we just lift up the prayer requests that have been mentioned. We lift up those of us who are sick those of us who are hurting, Lord, just whatever their need, Father, we place them in your hand, and we pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them as only you can. Lord, just help us to, just. we would pray that you would increase our faith, Father, that we could believe more, that we'd have more faith, that we would fear not, Lord, that we would have a spirit of hope, and that we'd be willing to face this world head on, Father, not afraid, but looking forward to the future, Looking forward to more opportunities to serve you, more opportunities to witness for you, and more opportunities, Lord, to, to stand for your word and to stand for your truth. Father, just illuminate the word through your Holy Spirit. Touch each and every heart here and just help us to understand what your spirit is teaching us and what your word tells us. Father, when we leave here, may we be more in love with you and more obedient to you and closer followers of your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now to back up just a second, if you back up, same chapter, back up to 19, it ain't on there, so I'm not even looking at that yet. It says, then the same day, this is speaking of the disciples, the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, uh, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sin you remit, they are remitted. And then them whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And so the disciples are assembled. And the disciples see Jesus, and Jesus comes in the midst of them. I'm not going to preach all those verses, but he comes in the midst of them. He says, peace be unto you. And that had to be a wonderful celebration. That had to be a wonderful feeling. You go from thinking Jesus is dead. Jesus has been crucified. The Davidic king is dead. The Messiah is dead. All hope is dead. All, all, everything's gone. We're done. We're lost. We're over. Ended. And then he appears. The doors are shut. And you've heard these women talk about him. And you've heard that the tomb is empty. And so if you're the disciples and you hear these women and they get John and Peter. And John and Peter race to the tomb and the tomb's empty. So they come back and they're like, hey, the tomb's empty. And you know, it would have been natural to be like, well, man, the Romans done stole the body. You know, them Pharisees, they couldn't even leave him alone. They, they, they done chopped him up and burned him. You know, they, they got rid of it. And so they're probably a little bit of doubt, and then he appears, and he's like, peace be unto you. And they would have been worshiping. They would have been praising. They would have been celebrating. But look at verse 24. <laughs> Might work tonight. Look at verse 24. It says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Have you ever missed everything? Have you ever? You've been a day late and a dollar short. You know what I mean? I know that's cliche, but it just seems like you miss. You know, the one time I don't show up for church and Jesus shows up. You know what I mean? That's kind of the boat Thomas is in. You know, all the others are there, and you know that when, you know, that, that Thomas, and it doesn't say where he was. He may have been dragging around. He may have been, you know, hiding. He may have been scared. He may have went out for Subway. I don't know where he was, but he wasn't with them at that time. He wasn't there. And so it says, but he was not with them. And so if you look at verse 25, when he comes back, you know, he could have 
come back and it had been great. They'd have been like, hey, Thomas, Jesus was here. And he should have been like, oh, that's awesome. That's great. You know, let's celebrate. Let's party. You know, I've been just thrilled to death. Let's worship the risen Lord and Savior. That's awesome. Look at 25. The other disciples, therefore, said unto him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. What a fuddy-duddy. I mean, how sad is that? You're the other disciples, the other ten, because Judas is dead. You got the other ten disciples, and they're like, Thomas, Jesus is here. He was risen. We saw him. He said, peace be unto us. The Messiah is back. He really did rise from the grave. And Thomas is like, I'll believe it when I see it. You ever known anybody like that? You know, that's one of the most common uh, responses that we get a lot of times. If you witness to somebody, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know. I don't believe anything I can't see. Well, I don't know how they survive in this world, because in case you all didn't know, there's like cell phone signals and Wi-Fi signals and all kinds of signals bouncing around this room right now. Who here thinks your cell phone's going to work? Everybody. It's like, well, duh. You know, I can pick up my cell phone and call whoever. I can't see that. If you can see cell signals, you probably ought to see a doctor. I mean, there's all kinds of things we can't see. Electricity and all kinds of these wonderful technology things that we cannot see. This little clicker that I fight with all the time. When I click it, you can't see the little signal that goes back there to the computer and sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But it does, you know, it's there. When it works, it's there. And so some people, though, they're like, well, I believe in Jesus Christ when I see him. Or how do you believe in a God that you can't see? Or, you know, how do you know God created the world? You wasn't there 6,000, 10,000, or 2 billion. So they're always thinking billions is 6,000. They're like, you wasn't there at the beginning. I'm like, well, how do you believe the world just popped into existence? You wasn't there either, you know? People are always doubting what they can't see. And so just spend a couple of moments thinking about things we can't see. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. You better mark John because we're coming back. But Hebrews chapter 11, the very, very definition of faith is Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. And, and Thomas would be wise uh, to understand this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How do we have faith in Jesus Christ? We have faith, by grace through faith, because of God's Holy Spirit. But do we ever see Jesus face to face? Not right now. But man, can't we see what he can do? Man, don't we know what he can do. When we simply step out on faith and let him lead the things he does for us, the way we feel, the comfort, the hope, the love, the joy, the, the smiles, the everything, we can see all of that. We can feel all of that. So no, we don't physically see him. But when you actually stop and look around, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's in, the, he's in the flowers. He's in creation. He's in the beauty. He's in love. He's in everything. And so Thomas, though, he's demanding. He says, I want to see. Well, Hebrews says, faith is the evidence of things not seen. How do we have faith today? Look over at Romans chapter 10. Thomas is demanding a sign. We are not going to get a sign today. But how do we have faith today? Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. How do we have faith today? So, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the preaching of an hour sermon by the word of God. That was most of that was right. All right. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't have a timetable on it. But that's how we have faith today. How did each and every one of us get saved? Because we heard somebody teach us about Jesus Christ. We heard somebody take the time, maybe it was a preacher, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, truth be told, it's all involved. You know, it's kind of like the cliche, uh, how many hits does it take to break a rock? If it takes 1,000 hits with a hammer to break a rock, which one of the hits was it? It wasn't just the last one, it was all 1,000. People are the same way, a Sunday school teacher teaches you, then you hear some preaching, then maybe you pray and you read the Bible, maybe a friend witnesses to you, and over the course of years, eventually you realize, I need Jesus. 
It's the course of all of that that builds up. And so today we hear and we have our faith to start believing in God's word, believing in Jesus Christ. And we have all of that because of God's word. The Bible that's in front of you, whether it's in a Bible or an iPhone or app or whatever, there's power in this word. There's amazing power. There's salvation power in the word of God. And so that's, Thomas needed a little bit of dose of that. So let's go back to him. Let's go back to John and see... Let's see what he does. I mean, he stands there, and, you know, in verse 25, he says, I believe it when I put my hand in his hands, and I put my hand in his side, then I'll believe it. That's why he earned the nickname Doubting Thomas. So notice a little bit about him. Look at verse 26. It says, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within. And Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So, same type of scenario. Now, what do you think they talked about for eight days? Anybody have, we gloss right over that. Eight days, you got Thomas going, Well, where is he? You got the other ten going, He was here, we done told you. Thomas going, I'm waiting. You know, he's Jesus. Where is he at? I mean, you can just tell there's probably tension. There's probably awkwardness. Now, I'm sure they're, they're going about their lives. There's still a little bit of fear. You know, Thomas is riling them up. Some of the others may have even started doubting themselves. Well, maybe we didn't see him. You know, where is he at? Maybe he's gone again. There, eight days. Eight days of awkwardness. Eight days of debate. Eight days of Thomas thinking he's right. Eight days of Thomas probably growing more and more bold. I knew he wasn't here the next day. Oh, I knew it. You know, after eight days, he's like, I've done told y'all he ain't here. And then Jesus shows up, and immediately he says, Peace be unto you. That makes you wonder a little bit that there was some tension there. There was some aggravation. There was some fear. There was some doubt. And Jesus shows up, and he just almost has the idea of, Guys, what are you fighting about? What are you arguing about? Why are you doubting? Literally, I done appeared to you eight days ago and showed you I done defeated hell and death. Why are you doubting now? This was another test almost. Eight days and Jesus comes back and says, Peace be unto you. And isn't it wonderful the peace that can come from Jesus Christ? Isn't it wonderful that we can get true peace from him? Look over at John chapter 14. Back up just a page or seven. John chapter 14, look at verse 27. Talking about the peace that only comes from Jesus Christ. Verse 27 says, Peace. This is words of Jesus himself, since it is in red. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Boy, that's a wonderful verse. We should have all been focused on over the last year, shouldn't we? We should have been realizing that, you know what, Jesus also says don't fear those that can kill you physically, fear those that can kill you spiritually. We as Christians are not to fear death. We are not to fear man. We are not to be afraid of the world. We are not to be afraid of these worldly things because we serve a Savior that already defeated hell and death. We serve a Savior that holds our salvation in His very hand. That's what these verses in 27, He says, I leave this peace with you. He says, I'm not giving it to you like the world where it's going to fail, whether it's going to rot, whether it's going to wither away. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And he, we could read the rest of that and keep going. But the point of that is, is we need to have peace that is only found in Jesus Christ. And so it's amazing when He shows up, what does He tell His disciples? Peace. You know, he calmed their fears, he calmed their doubts, and if we'll let him today, he will calm us too. Turn a page or so over. Look at John chapter 16. John 16, look at verse 33. Same idea. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, notice this, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Where are we to have peace? He says, in me. Peace is not found in a bottle. It's not found in the world. It's not found in the government. It's found in Jesus Christ. He says, peace you find in me. He says, in this world, and how about this for a warning? 
in this world ye shall have tribulation. Who here thinks you're not going to have tribulation? Everybody's like, well, no, you just read that. The Bible tells us you are going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have problems. But look at the rest of that sentence. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Oh, praise Jesus. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. Why are we afraid of the world? Do we serve the world or do we serve Jesus? Is the world going to save us or is Jesus going to save us? Are we going to go into eternity with the world or are we going into eternity with Jesus? Be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. Whew. Peace be unto you. I love those words. So how do you think old Thomas is feeling right now? we got to get back to him. I'll be here all day. Get back to old Thomas in verse 27. Jesus has something else to say. You remember, and I should have looked it up, it was either last week or the week, I guess it was the week before, it don't matter. Uh, watch all the Facebook videos, catch up. But if you look back, and Peter, if you remember, uh, Peter, you know, Peter had, had failed Jesus. He failed him, and he denied him three times. What happened immediately after G Peter denied Jesus three times? He said he looked over, and Jesus was looking at him. <sighs> Thomas is going to have one of those come to Jesus moments as well. Look at verse 27. Jesus, after he arrives, says, Peace be unto you. Then in verse 27, he says, Then saith he to Thomas, <sighs> looking right at him dead in his eye. You know what? It makes people nervous when you look him in the eye. I love every one of y'all, but if I stare at you long enough, every one of y'all kind of gets nervous. Every one of y'all starts thinking, What's he know about? <laughs> Start getting a little nervous, especially if you start preaching on sin. You start looking at people in the eye. They're like, "Shut up!" You start. It's real funny. A man and a wife. You look at them. They start getting close together. I hope he's looking at you. But uh, you can just see Thomas, and Jesus looks right at him and says, "Said he said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing." Whew. Calls him out, doesn't he? Jesus himself calls out Thomas. And there's an interesting, there's a little, kind of a little mini sermon in the middle of this sermon here. The fact that there's, what we can learn from this, Jesus calls Thomas out. But did you know each and every one of us is going to be called out as well? Flip over to Titus chapter 2. Kind of a mini sermon inside of a sermon. I've never done that before. Look at Thomas chapter 2, Jesus in verse 11. Jesus calls Thomas out himself, but at some point in time, every one of us is going to be called out. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There is not one of us that is going to be able to stand before Jesus and say, I didn't know. None of us are going to be able to stand before God and say, Lord, I can't be doomed to the lake of fire. Nobody ever told me about Jesus. That tells you right there, says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The conviction of the Holy Spirit will convict every single one of us. The problem is so many reject it. The problem is so many don't pay attention to it. The problem is so many don't answer the phone like it's a spam call. Y'all ever get spam calls? I hate those. I answer almost every one of them because I never know if it's somebody calling for the church or not. So I answer every one of them. And, you know, one of these days my car is going to break down and it's my own fault because I could have extended that warranty like 200 times. But it's like the Holy Spirit convicting us. So many people treat that like a spam call. And they're like, no. I don't want to be saved. I don't want nothing to do with eternal life with Jesus in heaven and eternal earth and the new Jerusalem and all these wonderful blessings. Uh-uh. I'd rather burn in the lake of fire. A lot of people say, oh, I don't believe in that. There's going to be a lot of people that are burning that wish they would have believed sooner. <laughs> there ain't going to be one atheist in hell, though. Every one of them is going to believe it's just going to be too late. It says at the end, all knees shall bow, doesn't it? At the end... And we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I'm about to preach ahead of myself. Go back to John. Let, let's see how old Thomas 
respond before I get carried away. Go back to Thomas. Jesus looked at him dead in the eye. Says, Thomas, come on. What did Thomas say? Eight days before, Thomas said, I will believe when I insert my hands into his side, into his feet, or into his hands, into his side. I'll believe it when I see it. Jesus appears and says, Thomas, come on. Thomas, I'm right here. Reach your hand into my side. Reach it into it. Come on. And what is Thomas saying, 28? It says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Testify, right? Now there's a big debate on whether or not Thomas actually physically stuck his hand out or not. Some people believe that Jesus said that and Thomas felt him and then believed. I don't really see that. I see Jesus appearing before Thomas, big shot Thomas. You know, I've sometimes ran my mouth and had to eat my words. Amen. Anybody else? Don't shake like that. My wife's like, amen, you have. <laughs> it's true. I have. Y'all are y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have done it too. <laughs> you, you, you run your mouth and said something. I, I, don't, I don't see that. I don't see that Thomas has to reach in. I see Thomas standing there. Jesus appears and says, Thomas, bring it on. And I see Thomas breaking down like that, going, my Lord and my God. I think he had a come to Jesus moment. I don't think he had to reach out by faith. I think sin was enough. And I think he repented and confessed and testified that quick. He woke up, didn't he? He woke up. All right, I got eight days arguing you ain't here. Lord, I'm sorry. You know, God has a way of getting our attention, doesn't he? God has a way of sometimes we wonder, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? Well, it's because you wasn't paying attention. I had to get your attention. It's kind of like parents. Sometimes we have to get our children's attention. You all know what I mean. We're the same way. We're, we're children. Sometimes God has to get our attention. Jesus stood before Thomas, and Thomas said, My Lord and my God. That brings me to the many point two. Flip over to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two and verse 10. And verse 11. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. says that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is that telling us? Look at verse 10 again. Things in heaven, that's all those that have passed on believing in Christ that are up in heaven. Things in the earth, that's all of us that are still here when Christ comes back and we're still here. And things under the earth, that's everybody burning in hell. But at the, when Jesus comes back, notice, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It does not say that all those that are burning eternally will be set free. Unfortunately, that's not true. But they will suffer for eternity knowing that Jesus died for them and they failed to believe. I don't know that there's a sadder thought in the world. The fact that Jesus, as we saw over the last few weeks, Jesus took the cross took the pain, took the suffering, took our sin, come out of the grave and did it all for you and the thought that someone will spend eternity knowing they failed him, knowing they had an opportunity, instead they're burning for eternity, that should motivate every child of God to work that much harder. I think one of the, one of the hardest things, and, and we're going to stand before Jesus, save people will, says we're going to stand before him and be judged over things good or bad, how hard we worked, how hard we served. I think one of the hardest things that's going to break our hearts is when we stand before him and Jesus goes, eh, I don't know if he's going to show us. I always picture like this projector screen. Uh, I figure heaven's got great Wi-Fi. I always picture his projector screen. He's going through our lives. And I think what's going to hurt us the most is not necessarily what we've done, but all the times he's going to show us people that we were supposed to witness to and we didn't. And we're going to say, Lord, where are they now? You were their last chance before they died. 
Can you imagine that? Standing before Jesus knowing you had an opportunity to witness to somebody and you failed because you were too tired, too busy, too selfish, too arrogant, too prideful, too something. And since you didn't witness to them, they got in a car and died in a car wreck and never had another chance. So Jesus calls out Thomas, and Thomas immediately confesses. Oh, if we would all confess tonight, if we would all testify tonight. I pray that everyone here is saved in a crowd like this. I'm sure there's some that aren't. I pray that when you get that opportunity and conviction of the Holy Spirit, that you would take that opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ and call upon His name and find out what salvation is because none of us are promised another day. And so we see that Thomas is called out. We see that Thomas confesses Jesus Christ. Now look what Christ says next. We're, we're talked about. I don't know about y'all, but I love it when I see us mentioned in the Bible. I think that's amazing. And I don't mean to sound selfishly, but I love knowing that Jesus was thinking about us 2,000 years ago. I mean, how much greater a Savior can you have that He's picturing us 2,000 years ago? Look what He says in verse 29. If you turn there. Jesus said unto him, to Thomas, says, Thomas, because thou hast seen, and this is why I think He just didn't touch him. I think Thomas believed by sight. He says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Who is those that have not seen and yet believed? The whosoever. I've never seen Jesus face to face, but as we've said before, we see him all around us. Jesus says, Thomas, you believe because you saw, but blessed are they that are going to believe that haven't saw. He's talking about the next 2,000 years worth of God's people all the way up to today in 2021. The people sitting here at Lakeview that's put their faith and trust in Jesus, he's talking about us. I don't know about y'all, but I feel blessed. I feel blessed because Jesus Christ died for us. And you know what? Just a few hours before this, or actually since this is eight days later, I guess it had been like 11 days before, right before the crucifixion, let's look at that. Flip over to John chapter 17. Just back a page or two. John chapter 17. Pick up verse 20 and 21. Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane praying for, for his disciples, praying to God for strength. And look what he says in chapter 17, verse 20. He says, neither, I pray, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. If you back up to 20, so notice what he says. He says, I'm praying for them that believe on me through their word, the people that the disciples would preach to and believe, and from those disciples would preach to the next people, and the next people, the next people, all the way down to us. So we've got Jesus in about an 11-day period praying for us before he takes the cross, and then telling Thomas afterwards, blessed are they that will believe. Amen. Jesus was thinking about us. You know why? Because when you put your faith and trust in Him, we become children of God, don't we? And God loves His children. That makes us brothers to Jesus. And He's a wonderful big brother. He doesn't pick on us. He doesn't beat us up. He doesn't hide our candy. He loves us unconditionally. And oh, how we should love Him. Now, go back to Thomas. Let's see how, let's see how this all finishes out. Go back to John chapter 20. How John finishes this out. It just, you see that Thomas becomes a changed person. It doesn't go back and tell us really. But kind of like Peter, we see Thomas is a changed man because of what he believes. And how does John end this particular chapter? Look at verse 30 and 31. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye why? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Why did John write this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Because he wants us to believe by faith, not by sight. 
He wants us to believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, the Son of God. And what does it say? By believing in that, you will have life through the name of Jesus. Acts tells us there's no other name under the sun that you must have salvation. We have our salvation through Jesus Christ. And so what kind of life is that? Well, it's a two-part. There in verse 31 says you might have life through his name. That's a two-parter. Flip over to John chapter 8. A lot of people skip this one. John chapter 8, if you look at verse 12. It says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What's that telling you? If you don't have Jesus, you are walking in darkness. If you don't have Christ, your world is miserable. Now, I know every one of us can turn on the TV and see these atheist Hollywood celebrities, and they're living it up in mansions and cars, and then they go out and they get depressed and they kill themselves. Why? Because they're not living life to the fullest, because they don't have Jesus. And as Psalms tells us, one of the psalmists cries out, Lord, why do the wicked prosper? And God basically says, because they're living their best life now. A child of God, our best life is in eternity. Not in treasures in this life, but treasures in the eternal life where moth and rust will not corrupt. Everything on this world keeps breaking. I can tear stuff up. I could tear a bowling ball up with a rubber mallet. But all those things that we're storing up in heaven, the mansion Jesus is building, even I can't tear that up. It's going to take a lot of Holy Spirit, but even I can't tear that up. But if you notice, what is it telling us here? And in the verse 12, it's saying Jesus is the light of the world. If you don't have him, you're walking in darkness. That's telling us that Jesus saves us to having a wonderful life here, not in the, in the ways of possessions or in the ways people try to think wonderful. But if you honestly think about it and you honestly ask a child of God, when you're walking with Jesus, it doesn't matter what you have because you have Jesus. We're saved to a life following Him, being obedient to Him, serving Him. Does it cost? Oh, yeah, it's got a cost. Will you be rich? Probably not. But, oh, we'll be rich in treasures beyond our comprehension. The fellowship, the relationship, the closeness, the love, the comfort, the peace, the joy that we have in Jesus is unparalleled in the world. And so when we believe in Jesus, we are saved to a life here. Now, of course, the biggest, longest, most important part. After this life here, just turn back. Since we're in John, we've been staying in John. We've got to get the best verse in John. Everybody knows it. <laughs> John 3.16, what kind of life do we have when we believe in Jesus Christ? I'm going to look and actually read it out of the book. Follow along. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What kind of life do we have in Jesus? Everlasting. Never ending. Eternal. Forever. With Jesus Him. What a wonderful Savior we have. And so just a few questions tonight. You know, don't be like Thomas. You say, Thomas was a disciple. Yeah, and Thomas grew, but we can't be like Thomas. We have to believe by faith, don't we? We have to believe by blind faith that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Don't wait until you see Jesus face to face. We'll all stand before him one day. If you wait till then, he's going to say, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. So sad. Don't wait until you meet him face to face. So if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would pray that you come to know him tonight. Let the Holy Spirit that's already convicting you, you're already fighting it, you're struggling with it, you can barely breathe, you're under conviction, stop fighting it. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and simply call upon his name and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. 
Jesus, I need a Savior. I believe you're the Savior. Please save me. However you word that, when you believe and you call upon Jesus and seek salvation, you're saved for eternity. And then as John 3.16 says, you have eternal life. And then child of God, maybe you're already saved. Don't be like Thomas. Don't be less than faithful. And notice another thing, and I didn't even hammer this home. Where was Thomas the first day? You know what? It might have been because they had service that night. Don't be like Thomas. Be faithful. Be there. You know what? We never know what's going to happen. We never know when God's going to bless us or do something. We need to be serving Him all the time, expecting to be blessed because we're serving a wonderful Savior. So if you're here tonight and maybe you have backslidden, Maybe you're not as faithful as you once were. Tonight would be a wonderful night to decide to be more faithful. Or maybe you simply just want to pray, Jesus, thank you. As the song leader comes and the musicians come tonight, if you need salvation, go to Jesus Christ for salvation. Tonight can be the night of salvation. It will be the best night of your life. Child of God, as we stand, whatever needs you have, whatever holds in your heart, the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is to be more faithful to Him. If you're a child of God and you're not serving, then you're miserable. The answer is serving Jesus more. Maybe you're doing wonderful. If you are, then I pray. Let's do it. Amen. Thank Jesus for that because if you're doing wonderful, if you're staying strong, if you're being comforted, it's because of Jesus Christ. So whatever your need is tonight, Go to him in prayer as we sing.